You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I watched my mum get beat up for a couple of years through a bad boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, whatever, and um, that affected me massively when I was younger. So it made me violent, aggressive. Mm. Just wanted to kick fuck out of everyone. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. It's my way of dealing with things. Felt a finger. Yeah, yeah, just that was my way of rationalising rationalizing situations mm -hmm. with aggression. I had an experience with heroin that were out of my hands because there were family members using it and overdosing and seeing them deteriorate. One of my idols was an heroin addict, you know, my cousin, Vincent. And, you know, I reached a certain age where I realised that, you know, it's time to sort of be my own idol. I was 33 when he passed. He was 34 and, um, yeah. It, it affected me and a lot of other people. It affected a lot of other people. Alistair was the, the rock for a lot of people and no one knew that he had his own shit going on mm -hmm. and he took his own life. Mm -hmm. It's really awful. What was the turning point to go, right, I need to get my shit together here? Did you have a moment? Yeah, being skint and potentially being skint forever because my acting career, there were no real love for it anymore and that's where I got my income from. So being skin, and I realised that I had to make money and I had to start making money big and fast, otherwise it weren't going to be enough to distract me and keep me focused. When we're on. Are we on? Yes, live. we're on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Not live. <laughs> Thanks for inviting us, yeah. thank you. Actor, Jodie Latham. Yeah. I said I guess it right. So. Yeah. How have Feels you been? weird hearing it said like that now. Yeah. Yeah. How have you to, been? Been all right. Yeah, been all right. Mm -hmm. Been a lot going on the past few years, but yeah. you know, particularly this year for everyone. But yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, it's a weird I'm time, right. mate. I've seen um in the papers a few weeks ago from actor to entrepreneur. <laughs> we um, kick you straight off yeah, with that. Yeah, as well, mate. <laughs> Business worth twenty mil. Eighteen it's, million fortune. Yeah, well we're always looking for sponsors as well, bro. So you know what I mean? You can always throw a couple of bones out of Yeah, you'd be, you'd be surprised the amount of sponsor requests we've had recently. <laughs> How's life? Life's good, yeah, life's good. I've like like everyone else, we're in a bit of a turmoil at the moment with what's been going on and you know, we're just coming out of a second lockdown. Yeah. So I think um like a lot of other people, my mental health have been great over the lockdown period. You know, it, it kinda gets to you after a little while. You know, the biggest thing for me is socialising. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a lot of friends, but I like to see my friends as often as possible. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm always out and about and having dinners and going out for drinks and it's what life's about. Keeping busy. Yeah, and with lockdown, it's it's near impossible. Yeah, it's a weird time and I always say it, but a lot of people are just trying to keep their head above water. A lot of people seem to be sinking just now and it's, uh, it's a bad time, not just mental health, but you've got people struggling with businesses and money problems that's coming mm. up to Christmas. You've got vaccines coming into play. People are just all over the place, just... Try and stay in your lane and, and just understand that things will yeah, be better. Yeah, sometimes it is as simple as that. You've just yeah. got to stay focused day mm -hmm. by day and all that. But, yeah. you know, for those who are out there with mental health watching, you know, you're not on your own. Everyone's struggling. Yeah. I think it's been a big thing for me this year, mm -hmm. dealing with, you know, things like anxiety and depression. Uh, I don't suffer from depression, or at least I haven't done until recently, but the last three months lockdown and... And the last sort of month, I've been really feeling it more. Yeah, I've been feeling yeah. it more, and you yeah. know, the, the nearest thing to socialising is taking my dogs out for a walk on yeah. Eaton Park. Or, yeah. Sometimes you know that's all mean? you need, mates. Dogs I over know, humans, it, I always say. They've kept me going. Yeah. Huncho and Lila have kept me going. My mm -hmm. little Frenchies, they really have. I'd be lost without them. Yeah. And of course, my kids as well and mm -hmm. family. But you know, I spend every day of my life with my dogs. Yeah, dogs so are the main to thing, not have yeah. them there going through this. Yeah, so. but it's a great thing to touch on. We'll touch up on that later on in the podcast. Yeah. Because even though your business is flying, you've got all the external stuff, you're still battling, brother. Yeah, like everyone else, yeah. I think it's just been tough, hasn't it? Yeah, but I always go back to time. the start with my guests. Please, yes, go for where it, you go grew for up it. And how it all began. Yeah, go for it. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, where did I start? Wow, so I was born in Burnley, Burnley, Lancashire. Um, I was born um, two siblings. I had my sister and myself um, and my mum. She was a single parent family first few years of our life growing up. So we had struggles and my mum was kind of doing the best she could to raise us without much money. 
and um, pushing us around in a double bugger. There was only a year between us. And she managed to um, to work hard to get us the things that we needed and be able to provide for us. And then when she was seven, excuse me, when I was seven, my, when I was seven, my mum met my, he's now my dad, my stepdad, I call him dad. And things changed a lot for us then, you know, there's bigger income and we had a father figure there, someone to tell us off. Yeah. And my mum had a companion and together they worked hard to kind of provide a solid future for us. Yeah, strong upbringing then once yeah, and the male us, figure came in. Yeah, we had, um, we, you know, we, we were living pretty much in poverty. We weren't desperate, but we didn't have anything and we were living in and around poverty and they managed to do the house up that we were living in and be able to, to get enough funds from that to, yeah. to eventually buy that and, and sell up and build a an house for yeah. us that became our How own. How was your schooling and stuff growing up? Um, nightmare. Rascal, were you? How <laughs> nightmare. <come? laughs> Shit. I can I imagine that, mate, to be <laughs> honest. I me on cup of tea. <laughs> were you a pest? Um, yeah, I was just really angry as a kid growing up. I watched... Um, I seen some things I were younger that didn't suit me very well, that didn't didn't sit very well with me as a child. And like what? I watched my mum get beat up for a couple of years through a bad boyfriend, ex boyfriend, whatever, and um, that affected me massively when I was younger. So it made me violent, aggressive. Hmm. Just wanted to kick fuck out of everyone. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. It's my way of dealing with things. Fold the finger. Yeah, yeah. Just that was my way of rationalizing rationalizing situations. Mm-hmm with aggression yeah. and that kind of energy. So you went through schooling like that as well? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Just wanted to fight my way up the pecking order and yeah. get a reputation for myself, mm-hmm. really. And just being, just, I think it was more about letting people know they couldn't push me around. Yeah, hmm. but you'll tend to see the ones who feel that way are the ones who are most broken inside. Yeah, I think it affected yeah. me a lot, but, yeah. you know. That becomes the mask, doesn't it, that you want to yeah, portray the, yourself as tough and violent and really, we just don't want to be fucking have a wee cuddle and loved me, in it. Yeah, I think that you realise that when you get a bit <laughs> yeah. older, don't you? Uh, you? When you get a bit older, but I think when you're young and you've got a lot to prove. So what age then did you start acting? Did you ever start? Did you ever? I'd always acting been acting class? right the way through school. Yeah. So there's a couple of teachers who took a little bit of a shine to me and realised that I had some lovable rogue. Yeah, some issues that kind of deeper than sort of. Did the acting like take you away from? Like your it method did. of thinking. It gave me a, it gave me a sort of an outreach. It sort of give me an outreach. It gave me um, a stage to perform without getting in, in trouble. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It kind of allowed me to be the centre of attention without having to be rolling around at middle yeah. of the playground scrapping yeah. or yeah, so not, not getting picked for a football team because yeah. everyone knew I was going to kick off. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the last one to get yeah. picked. So basically, the acting was like you could be somebody, take you away from the real reality of life. I guess so, yeah, but it was just an opportunity for showcase myself and what I believed, you know, I, w- I wanted attention, clearly. Mm-hmm. So I think some of the teachers saw this and gave me opportunities to be lead yeah. roles in certain school productions. So what? I always concentrated... Go on, sorry. No, it's on your own. I always really concent- really worked hard on getting the roles at school. What kind of roles? <laughs> I was having this conversation with my daughter, actually, because she's just been picked as... Um, she's just been cast, excuse me, as the lead role in a school nativity play, um, Little Angel Gets Her Wings. Mm. Hey! Yeah. And she's cast as the Little Angel, so she's got the title role. She's so excited. You're proud? Oh, God, yeah. So proud. Jealous, actually. <laughs> 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 Completely jealous. I'm like, they got a part for me. Mm. But um, no, seriously, um, she was really p- pleased with that. And I was telling her some of the different roles I played. And she was like, she was a little bit taken aback by the fact that I played the Christmas Angel one year. And wore a fairy dress, oh. and I thought that was just banter, you, you know. Get any photos? I was about ten. No, I don't. I'd, I'd pay to see that photo right now. <laughs> Maybe I won't. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, like all kinds of roles. We played um, Jonah in uh, Story of the Whale, and I played um, I've played Joseph in the Nativity play, and then things got a little bit better. I was cast as Chief Weasel at Burnley Youth Theatre, mm-hmm. and started Burnley Youth Theatre with my sister when I was fourteen. After doing a few successful plays at school and secondary school I just wanted to do more so we looked at getting into a production group a production company or a sort of a youth theatre community group whatever and we found um, we came across Burnley Youth Theatre we'd been looking for something like something like that in the community for years and we could never we never came across it as a family member in- introduced us because she'd been going a few years we were more bothered about the fact she'd been going for three years and failed to tell us mm-hmm. 
But yeah, we, we joined Burnley Youth Theatre. I was 14, my sister was 13. And it progressed from there. We started getting good roles early on. Um, told her, told her, she was playing Phoebe. I played Chief Weasel, Chief Ferret. And then we just got better roles. And within a couple of years of being at Burnley Youth Theatre, actually, it weren't a couple of years. It was just a few months being at Burnley Youth Theatre. We was introduced to um, casting directors from Manchester. Um, Beverly Keogh and David Shaw. And at the time they were casting. So it was at um, Burnley Youth Theatre and they basically contacted us to let us know there were going to be some auditions for television. And for me, that was like, I just knew. Yeah. I just knew this. Did was, you believe? Do you have that belief? I don't, it's just, just, I kind of been pursuing it for so long mm -hmm. and looking down different avenues to find like, you know, things after school and clubs and, you know, you weren't too old or it were in Manchester and it were too far or there was loads going on in Manchester, but we was like 30 miles away and minimal budget my parents had. They couldn't yeah. be, it's just impossible to drive a kid to Manchester twice a week or even weekly mm -hmm. and commit to that. It's a big commitment. Yeah. And so, um, which I understand actually as I got older, some kids did and then I bump into later on in life, but it just weren't, we weren't able to do it at the time. Yeah. We concentrated on Berlin Youth Theatre. Within a few months, we started getting casting. Um, we started getting cast for roles on TV. Where the Heart Is was one of the first roles I went up for. And I went, got a recall and got invited to I think it was Huddersfield or Leeds for the cast for the casting and for the audition, excuse me. And I didn't get it and I was wounded. I was in pieces. It really affected me. And um, for, for weeks, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I thought this was my one opportunity and I didn't get it. So I was cursing myself and I was beating myself up about it. And then they came back and they asked for me specifically. And I was like, what they wanted me, and I hadn't been for a few weeks. I think I'd sort of spat my dummy out, kind of fingers up, attitude as usual, Jody sort of trait. And I stopped going. I was like, nah, fuck this, I've had enough. My sister carried on, I think. And I was like, you need to keep going, you need to keep going, because obviously she wanted me not, she didn't want me dossing about on the street, she wanted me in Burnley Youth Theatre two or three times a week, warm and protected and safe. And um, they called me back. And Burnley Youth Theatre rang and said, they really want you to come for this audition. Um, you need to come in. I was like, really? They want, they've asked for you specifically. They want to see other people, but they've asked for you specifically. Will Jodie be there? So you need to come. And for them to ring me, I think was really humble and really decent of them because they mm -hmm. could have just let some other kids go in there and who knows. It's scary that that bad rejection can throw you right off course. Yeah, it that? did. It did. Mm -hmm. But I think in a lot of aspects of life, I had that... Um, don't give a fuck attitude, but actually it really hurt me when I didn't get things. I didn't like rejection at all. Mm -hmm. Definitely in the wrong career. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't deal with rejection <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> so I'm to that. choose to, to build a career based on 95% rejection mm -hmm. is just, um, yeah, poor decision making. But I think that you know, I always had, I'd always had this desire to um, go to Hollywood and be a movie star. Mm -hmm. But more importantly than that, you know, I wanted, I wanted to find fame through acting. It's what I wanted as a kid. It was what I wanted. And I didn't really know why until I were older, but again, it was just part of my childhood. Yeah. Just wanting attention, wanting to be seen, recognised, and then obviously get appraisal and, yeah. and reward for doing well so I always put a lot to? into my career and my what acting career way? who did you look up to who did you, did you inspire to be um, for me it weren't really about I didn't really have many idols mm -hmm. I just seen people around me who I didn't want to be like I wanted to be the opposite of do you know what I mean so I took influence from people who are doing things bad things and wrong things and saw that I didn't want to do that like taking heroin surrounded by it as a teenager growing up. So, you know, just a, maybe not the best analogy, but I, you know, that's an example of it. I didn't want to take heroin, so I never took heroin. You know, I've tried other drugs, you know, as a yeah. child we do, don't we? Growing up, teenager, partying, raving, going to festivals. But, you know, I, I had a, like, I had an experience with heroin that were out of my hands because there were family members using it and overdosing and seeing them deteriorate. One of my idols was an heroin addict. You know, my cousin, Vincent, and, you know, I reached a certain age where I realised that, you know, it's time to sort of be my own idol. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
But then there was actors who I looked up to and I kind of admired and thought, wow, I'd love to be there. You know? Yeah. Um, Edward Norton, you know, great he did actor. great actor and Fight Club, American History X, mm -hmm. and just to name a couple of them. They were the violent ones. But, yeah. Um, yeah, Edward Norton, you know, Brad Pitt, Pacino, you know, De Niro. There's all actors that I looked up at and I had sort of looked up to and admired, but they weren't really idols. Yeah. I weren't really closing my eyes thinking about what what, 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 he, what, what what they're doing in this situation, how would they deal with that? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How hard is it to act? Um, it depends, really. Some things I've found really easy. Because I kind of class myself as a method actor, so with that, I'm untrained. But with that, I kind of have to take myself back to a, an experience that relates to that and then really take myself through the paces. So it's the acting bit weren't weren't hard at all. I found that quite easy. It was coming down from it afterwards, going back to an hotel room for four hours on your own and dealing with what you've just processed. Because it's almost like post-traumatic stress in a way. You know, some of the situations that you're in, like some actors will be watching this thinking, wow, he's crazy, like, you should never do that to yourself. Or, you know, actors have gone through drama school and things, you know, they do things differently, but I very much run around the block five times and make yourself tired if you need to be yeah. tired in the scene. You know, if I'm in a gym lifting weights, then let's get in the gym and do an hour's weight training prior to the scene kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so then if that meant you're dealing with a scene where, you know, you've maybe uh, experiencing trauma like death, losing someone close to you, then you kind of have to take yourself to them dark places in order to get the... Yeah performance that you want and to make it real and natural is that a mentally draining them because i know like daniel day lewis and you look at them but i think as they got older it must really battle because the mind the brain is like a sponge it will absorb everything so for you to be a different character the brain will believe you are that character yeah, so it yeah, must be absolutely potentially yeah. damaging over is, a long period it, of time it can be and you know you do need to take time out for that <coughs> excuse me but i think you get that's the only way i've ever been able to get the results that's the way i've sort of worked on and how it's developed for me mm -hmm. in terms of acting. Um, you know, I've tried different methods, it doesn't work for me. Yeah. I don't like to read a script 50 times. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be word perfect when I go on set. It's got to be a bit different and humanised and make it my yeah. own. Some writers don't like that either. Yeah, Especially when you're working yeah. with Paul Abbott and he's almost like a... How was he to work with? Great, yeah. Paul Abbott, I mean, you know, I, you never hear me say a bad word about mm -hmm. Paul Abbott. He's a fucking genius. Yeah. He's an absolute genius. You should do a podcast with him if yeah, you can. Yeah, I will. But uh, he's a bit shy sometimes. You find to see a lot of actors are shy. I've got a lot of acting friends and <coughs> comedian friends, and a lot of them are the most shyest people you ever meet in your life, but yet when they're performing or on stage, it's you think, wow, man, they, they, they are so confident. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, it's similar, isn't it? It's like a comedian. Like, you won't ask a comedian to tell you a joke in a pub. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the last thing you want to say. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And kind of people, they, they expect things of you that are similar mm -hmm. to that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So well, Can you cry on the spot? Yeah. Well, yeah, of course I can, but you're uh. not fucking getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Did you have many friends going through, like your teenage years? Do we years? swear or not swear? We can not swear. We can do what the fuck we want. Oh, right, okay, yeah, fair yeah. enough. I'll have that. You can I try not to, but... Yeah. It's more professional, but it's... Um, like you say, I like to keep it raw and real. I try not to swear as much because... Some people say that's lack of vocabulary, but I just like to swear. It just gives it a wee bit more Yeah, it's a bit of my character. Yeah. If I'm not swearing a little bit, you're not getting yeah, the real me. Yeah. Did you have many Sorry. friends growing up? Oh, Old, yeah. Just How did they treat you from acting? And look, boys, you want to play football that and thing, fight and take drugs? That was the biggest thing for me, like, looking back. I gave a lot to become an actor. I sacrificed a lot of things. You know, I sacrificed weekends away with mates, holidays. You know, sacrifice social life with my friends because I were away off filming. So, <clears throat> you lose connection with your, with your friends. I lost a lot of my friends who I had sort of growing up through school, secondary school especially. You know, um, you know, uh, Anthony Hurst, Johnny Brogan, Luke Bowman, Mickey Barker, Paul Barker, just dropping some names in mm -hmm. now so you know I actually forgot you. Um, and some of the girls as well. You know, like just losing my connection with them from school because I went, we kind of 14, 15, my acting career took off. 
And then at 16, I was like going London, in Manchester, you know, going off to auditions all the time and having to prepare, having to save my money for train fares. So I weren't able to go out and wax 50 quid on booze and go to a party and do whatever because, you know, I knew about two days recovery and I've got an audition on Monday. If I get the role, I could be filming as early as Friday. So, and before you knew it, I kind of, they went from sort of being 14, 15, and then leaving school, 16, 14, 15, developing my career. And then 15, it took off. And I went to college and a lot of my friends, they went to work in the local slaughterhouse. It was really weird. Like, it's just what you did. You went and got a job in Woodheads, I think it was called. Um, and they all went working in the slaughterhouse and they were on 110 quid a week. And I was absolutely mortified because they come after a day's work, they'd come out and they'd be talking about work, which you were no part of. And then they'd all have a wage that were coming on Friday, which were triple, quadruple, what I were getting. And of course, like, they were all working together and chatting and having this sort of separate friendship outside of what we were used to. You feel left out? Oh, massively, yeah, to the point where I nearly went and got a job at Woodheads. And I just think back now, fuck, what would have happened if I'd have actually gone uh, and got that job? Who knows? I mean, I'd have probably ended up putting in a, a petition for a management buyout and owning the place now, who know. knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I literally don't know, but... Who knows, I could just still be working there, happy with my 250 quid a week mm -hmm. wages and, and just living that normal life. But yeah, I guess always wondering what I'd have done now. It's so always weird, wonder, can't we think about the past in, in different directions we can go down? Can't regret it. Yeah, of course. There's no regrets, mm -hmm. but I kind of wonder, you still wonder, yeah, don't you? Of course, man, it's always good to think, shit, if i never done that or I did this differently. Well, none of them are there now. Yeah, exactly. That's a promising so, yeah, sight. Yeah, exactly. It's all in hindsight. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I never went through all the madness and misery I went through, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So you've kind of got to learn the craft from some sort of pain and misery and, and yeah. misfortunes. And it's just life. How did The Shameless come about? Changed your life, man? One of the biggest shows yeah. in Channel 4. Just Shameless was like, kind of like, excuse me. Shameless was like the first audition. Uh -huh. It was like I knew when I, I knew when I, when I'd been informed and requested to come in and meet the guys. I kind of knew already what it was going to be and how successful it was going to be, and I also knew what a great opportunity it were for me. So I'd almost like psychologically claimed it from the second I read the scripts. It's weird, like it's a mental thing that you go through. Well, Sometimes you pick up a script and you're like, "This ain't me. I ain't getting this." And of course, you go to audition and you don't hear back, uh -huh. but you have to go. It's a process. But with Shameless, for me, I knew, I kind of like, knew I had to take it and just own it yeah. from day one, do you know what I mean? What was the audition process like? Brutal, absolutely brutal, because they couldn't, they, basically they got me and Jared Cairns in straight away, the guy who plays Ian, my brother. I'm really nervous, by the way, can you tell? Are you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's because I'm sat next to this cold wall as well. <laughs> uh, I'm like a little bit shaky. Mm -hmm. So um, myself and Jared were the first guys in to be seen for Lip and Ian. And I saw, I don't know about Jared, but I went in with another couple of people on different days, spent like a half day. Liam um, Boyle was one of the actors. He was a good mate of mine, actually. We're quite pally. I don't see him much, but we're quite pally. And um, who else? There was Liam Boyle and another couple of guys that we were quite interested in. They're gonna hate me for this now. And um, they kind of, Paul had us in and the producers had us in and they, they maybe tried different setups to see what worked. They matched us up basically. And we didn't know what was going on. I, I just assumed that it was us, but they just needed to work out which one were playing which character. So we went through like 11 auditions in and out, spending half days, full days there, coming in with different cast members, lining up like screen tests and all that kind of caper. And it was, Every time you go in, you're thinking it's yours and you're nearer to it, but you've got to put yourself through that psychology like, I might not get this. I told you I reacted to the first one. Mm -hmm. I think it was back to Berlin Youth Theatre for three months. I went at Berlin Youth Theatre. What could I do now to spit my dummy out? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Go and lock myself away for a year. So I don't, I dread to think I would have, I would have reacted had I not have gotten it. But yeah, 11 auditions later, it's like, yeah, we're going to cast you. How would you feel about playing Ian? I was like, it's, I'm at a point where I can't not be in this. So if it's a case of who can deal with it better, me or Jed, it was Jed's first role. There was slightly naive, dare I say, at the time. And I think he was really reluctant to play 
this character as his first role. There was a lot involved. It was a big commitment. You know, he was only 17, 18. And being a straight guy, having to neck a bloke. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Especially when you come from the places me and Jed come from, mm -hmm. like I'm borderline council estate. You know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with that. But Would you've you got took to, that part you, if it came? I did. I took it. Yeah, I played. I played yeah. the gay. I played yeah, the gay let, character yeah. for three three weeks. So I played mm -hmm. Ian, mm -hmm. and um, Jerry Kearns played Lip. Yeah. So we cancelled filming. Got cancelled after a while, and they swapped the roles around. Something weren't working for them. So that's the producer's decision. But How was that acting then? Can I, that's just a craft, isn't it? Well, it was. It was. Or it did you struggle? Literally, but at the end of the day, like I looked, looked at it like this: like the biggest, the acting part weren't the issue. It was the physical part mm -hmm. that would have been the biggest challenge. Um, and then I just kind of mentally got over that. Just kind of, it's just going to be a, a, a scene, a shot, a quick take. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'll get over it. But they cancelled it. I didn't have to snog Chris Bisson, mm -hmm. which was great because he, he was quite a good friend <laughs> at the time as well. That would have made yeah. it even really more mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. Just knowing the guy, like we knew each other. Mm -hmm. I think if you went in with a stranger and it's just like, all right, lights off. Get stuck in, boys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do you do? Yeah. Laugh or cry, mm. just get on with it. So were you relieved then when you got the lip part? Yeah, and it weren't anything to do with the sexuality of the characters yeah. for me. I just I just felt that I were better suited to that role. Mm -hmm. And how did it change your life when you were on that? Because it was massive. It, how did you deal with that if you deal with anxiety and stuff like that? Was it hard? It. I mean... I loved it, like, I loved the attention that I were getting, it was brilliant, you know, it was like overnight fame, a load of money, driving around on an Audi convertible, like, what's not to love? Um, but I got carried away with it, you know, started partying hard, spending my money in the wrong places, you know, making stupid decisions. I think that's just part of being young. Yeah, you were early 20s, weren't you? Yeah, 21 when we started filming, so it's still, oh. still really young, yeah. you know, and like, I think to have it overnight, it's a big change. Was it everything? Got in a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. A lot of was everything you imagined to eventually be working that hard to get the part that you wanted to be, get the fame and the money? How? Yeah, deal, dealing with the fame and the money was the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. It's sort of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, as well as being in Manchester away from everything I knew. Fancy apartment, and it was a temptation galore. What was that? Yeah, oh, it's just hard to say. Were no. you going to? Say it, bust on it? Uh, no, actually. I never actually turned up pissed, although there was a, there is a horrible rumour suggesting that I once turned up to work leathered. Not shameless, another job, but it's not true. I never... I, don't get me wrong, there's been them times where there's like three hours and you probably stink of it still. Mm -hmm. But I've never turned up leathered. Just leaving a party and then going straight there? Yeah, I've never done that. Yeah. I've, I've always got a couple of hours in. Why did you only do the four seasons? Because... I had this misconception in my head that I was going to be a movie star. Hollywood? Yeah, that's what I wanted. And then when we come to apply and do all the legals, it weren't going to happen. I'd been too naughty. Really? Yeah, so it was just... So what happens? What do you mean? The, the American agents just kind of... They were like, it's too risky. And they would have had to invest so much into me to get stuff that they already had access to. And did you already leave Shameless to do and that? And I was, I was, I, as a 20 odd year old Englishman with a thick Burnley accent, mm -hmm. it's not as much as you want it and as much as you're a, you know, a star in your own country, dare I say that. Like, yeah. You know, Americans just, you, twine, just can't get, get the Burnley twine. Is, who's the Liverpool boy? Who's the Liverpool who does all the gangster films? Fucking great actor. Great actor. Uh, Stephen Graham. Oh, great yeah, actor, class. mate. Do you know Steve what I mean? Is a yeah. top guy. Yeah, yeah, we he's, love Steve. he's taking his game today. To next yeah, level. Yeah, he has, and so proud yeah, to see it. Like, it's good to see. A northerner succeeding. But that's the kind of vibe I would see you doing, is kind of, yeah. that he's, kind of shit. Yeah, he's, he's got a good relationship with the, um, help me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Departed and Gangs of New York, yeah. the director. Help me. Scorsese. Scorsese, excuse mm -hmm. me. Jesus. Yeah. That was another great film. Departed. It's nerves, that. It's nerves. Mm -hmm. um, but Scorsese and um, a few other directors now he's got a fantastic relationship with, and, yeah. Got so, his in. Yeah, he's got his in. I think it's fair to say he's got foundations he's there now. For it yeah, and I believe his wife as well has been doing great over there and Canadian dramas or something. Yeah. So to be honest, like past three years, I've been so focused on my own what stuff. stuff? That, yeah, I've, you know, because, you know, I like to spit my dummy out, don't I? Mm -hmm. So I've been acting for a little while and I've not really been 
You know, I kind of unfollowed all my actor friends. Why is that? Just because I didn't really want to know what everyone was doing. Or is that a bit of, not jealousy, but you, yeah, you, know, you still know it's your passion. Now, you've created a multi-million pound business. Is that, is that your passion? Or do you I know thought it was. Like, I think just being successful mm-hmm. in different domains makes me feel proud and content. But actually, I think that, you know, I'd love to go back to acting and do some serious roles. When did you take a break from it? I'm 37, so... Still young. It's nothing, is it? Fucking it's young, right. man. Look at me. Fucking yeah. handsome bastard, you know what I mean? You You're still I mean? young. I just got to get down the gym. <laughs> right. Same, mate. We're doing the camera angles on the go to chest type for. <laughs> so, when did you take a break from the acting? Well, it weren't, it was, it weren't, it was forced, really. Why? Um, I lost my best friend. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Alistair Eccles, my nearest and dearest. My absolute, like, just solid, like, it was like my other half of me, do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It's just the one person that gets you beyond anything. Mm-hmm. Nothing that can be said can offend. Nothing that can be said can upset or shock. Do you know what I mean? True best My friend. go-to guy, like. So to lose him was a big, big thing. And it made me just really sort of weigh up life, really. So then I started doing things based on... I, th- I think, to be fair... I didn't deal with it well, I just buried my head in business and that's why the business has become so successful. That's how I got over the grieving and dealing with the mourning and all that, so sort of burying my head in, in business. And and then now the business is successful, I thought I kind of want to sit back and do some more me stuff, but I just want to do other things that involve business and success. And I think sometimes I hide behind things like business, roles it's easy mm-hmm. do you know what I mean rather than just head, head and the problem face on but yeah. again everybody deals with trauma differently some yeah. people deal with it from drink drugs whatever it is to hide from the pain that you're hurting but this is life and mm-hmm. you've put your head into business it's not a bad thing but now you've you've not completed it but your own path to it you've probably realised well realized, it was that or yeah. a bag of gear or a bottle of vodka mm-hmm. do you know what I mean which some people do I've done it for many years you know. and that's that's another way of dealing with, gr- with grief and you know, if anything, I moved away from things like that. Tried to separate myself from certain people, certain groups, so I weren't enticed to mm-hmm. going down the wrong roads again. How old was he? 33. Still a young boy. 34, excuse me. Mm-hmm. I was 33 when he passed. He was 34. And, um, yeah, it, it affected me and a lot of other people. It affected a lot of other people. Alistair was the, the rock for a lot of people and no one knew that he had his own shit going on mm-hmm. and he took his own life. Mm. Mm. It's really awful. Yeah, it's still playing your mind that. Yeah, it still, still really messes me up to think about but, you know, it's part of dealing with it, talking yeah. about it. Yeah, I've lost money. So, so, yes, I'm sorry to hear that, man. I'm sorry to hear that. I've lost suicide and it's, when someone set their mind on something as, as tragic as that, then... There's not much you can really do because the pain is still left. And I said in a podcast, I think, last week, it's not that they take away the pain, but the pain kind of gets passed on. Mm. And when it, and it's sad because like one of my friends, Anne Rowan, I do a lot of suicide work up in Glasgow, and she her son committed suicide, and he's, the son thought that nobody cared, but at his funeral, was over a 1,000 people, and it's made her create Chrissy's House, which is a 24-7 suicide centre in Scotland. Right, oh wow. So she's focused on wow. that energy that's, and then impressive. changing other lives and realising that there is an out and there is hope. And I don't know if it's because so so much social media or so much pressure on people's shoulders that were not good enough, that were inferior, when really we're all special. Everybody's special. It's just certain circumstances that can really change your mindset. Now, I'm in a great place, but I'm still battle every day. Certain problems, certain scenarios, certain situations, thinking about lost loved ones, thinking about wishing they were here, but there comes a time you've just got to go fuck it and life goes on, kind of selfish mentality, but it can be hard. Mm. So how did you deal with that after the first couple of Did, years? Didn't deal with it at first very well, just just messed me up emotionally, just really messed me up emotionally. and um. I broke up with a girl over it just because I weren't, I was looking for things that she couldn't give me. So I lost her and then that made me worse. You know, I had problems with my baby mum because of alcohol and, you know, the things that responsibilities and decisions I were making 
poor decisions I were making because I weren't focused and I was grieving Alistair and drinking too much. And then I just realised that it had to stop. It all had to stop, you know, like for my daughter's sake. How old's your daughter? She's six. She's six. She's like, she's amazing. She makes me so proud every day because she's on a, on point. Like, she does like she she does she does class. She's a counsellor on the as mm -hmm. part of the school council of governors. You know, she's getting lead roles. She's got lots of friends. She's considerate and caring, and she's humble and she's she does. Everything I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, I love her. Yeah, we did this kind of yourself. Uh, it's, uh, and for that, I love her so yeah. much that she's literally like, she's my heart, she's my everything. And my, and my yeah. son, and my son as well. Like, How old is I, I talk, he? I talk about my little girl like that because she's still mm -hmm. six and she's just a little yeah. baby, but he's just like... How old is he? Scruffy little teenage, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, is he? <laughs> he's 19. Yeah. Oh, he just rings me up when he wants money. <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know how he is. <laughs> yeah. I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't begin to imagine how he is. Mm. I just know he's all right because yeah. he still dials me up mm -hmm. and says, Dad, I'm skint. I'm like... Jacket. How much is this gonna cost me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you when you were sitting drinking, taking drugs, what was going through your mind then at that point? You ever suicidal yourself? No, I couldn't afford to be tempted. I couldn't. Mm. I couldn't afford to play with these ideas in my head. It weren't available to me. It weren't something yeah. that were on the table. Mm -hmm. Like self harming. <clears throat> Although drinking and you know substance misuse is self harming. Yeah, isn't it? It's the worst way. Mm -hmm. You know, slow death. Um, but yeah, self-harming in subst through substance abuse, I guess. <clears throat> but suicide um, was never something that were an option for me because I've got children. What was so, the turning point for you? And the you know, moment I don't want to upset or offend anyone there. Mm -hmm. It's just for me, like I can never pass that on to them. So yeah. you know, however it is to be, it won't be that way. Mm -hmm. What was the turning point to go right? I need to get my shit together here. Did you have a moment? Yeah, being skint and potentially being skint forever because my acting career, there were no real love for it anymore. And that's where I got my income from. So being skint and I realised that I had to make money and I had to start making money big and fast. Otherwise, it weren't going to be enough to distract me and keep me focused. So I set up my, um, I set up a partnership, um, a company which basically um, offered services in the aesthetics industry. So Botox and fillers, essentially. And I had a partner who injected and I basically marketed the company. So I had the premises and the facilities and she basically turned up and we kind of, we did a 50-50 kind of partnership. And we went down the road of injecting girls, lip fillers, Botox, and we made a lot of money fast. Um, and I realised there was there's an opportunity in the industry to do well. This was four or five years ago, so there's a lot of people popped up since then, offering services and selling fillers, which is what I do now. There's a hell of a lot more doing it. At the time, there were probably less than 15, 20 people in the country doing it. Now there's probably a couple of hundred. So we really like hit the ground running. And with the fillers um, and Botox that we're injecting, we're in Blackpool in a clinic that was owned by my brother, he had a sunbed shop. So we just set up a clinic in the sunbed shop and it worked really well because we were able to just drag customers from upstairs. Drag, it's not the best, <laughs> it's not the best, most professional yeah, yeah. word. Yeah. But yeah, we literally dragged them up. Like, what do you mean no, come and have a look. Come up here and have a look. And we introduced, you know, we was the, at Dean's Gate Aesthetics, we was the first sort of, for a lot of girls in Blackpool, we were their first sort of go-to place for fillers and Botox. Young girls, particularly for lip fillers. And it just surged, the industry's huge now. Massive market for it. A lot of girls, young girls, and girls who were um, of a more mature age, love it. Younger girls like it for fashionable, desirable reasons. They want things like Russian lips and certain lip techniques, which gives them defined volume and sort of certain looks, what they have done. Some want fillers that are completely natural, but just want volume and want to replenish the skin and hydrate the skin. And 
you know, you can get fillers here for your nasolabial folds. You try to say something, bro. Yeah, <laughs> you to you, to business you, on you, here, you know, you get Botox, uh-huh. Botox around here, you get fillers down here in your jaw, your chin, your lips. So it can literally go anywhere, hands, temples. I don't need any more fillers in my jaw, uh, mate. I need yeah. shit took away, bro, <laughs> if I'm honest. We can do all sorts and the, the, the techniques and the services that are available are astonishing. Like a lot of people don't even know that what's available. And what's this called? Um, this is gone now. We had this is when we oh, had yeah, clinics, yeah. but I'm just saying in general, some mm-hmm. of the techniques and sort of products that are available now on the market, and now there's some fillers that you can have injected into your face just to hydrate. So you know, for guys like us who are handsome, you know, try to keep it together. Yeah, you know, <laughs> still, still trying to look good. Like, you know, you can have these treatments that mm-hmm. maybe don't give you definition or raise your cheeks or raise your jaws, but just replenish your skin less wrinkles and more hydrated literally puts like water into your face if i were to put it down to anything mm-hmm. extent, just to hydrate you and then you've got the old botox haven't you to get rid of the wrinkles yeah so, i might need some of that yeah, in the future. Bit, i'm not gonna lie how is it getting it i need some now to how is it getting it yeah there's a there's a bit of a misconception that it hurts but it, it's nah. minimal it's mm-hmm. minimal and there's little do you feel better with yourself getting that stuff yeah man 100 percent puts a spring in my step like I look back at pictures five six years ago and I look better now than I did then you know we have exhausting lifestyles you know you're going out you're on the road in and out of places we live in England so weather's fucking changing constantly Mm -hmm. one day it's red hot next thing it's snowing that's like the worst atmosphere for your skin and stuff like that and alcohol sleep drugs you know exactly past life abuse Mm -hmm. Do you know yeah. what I mean? All that substances mm-hmm. we've done over years. And you know what? It's not, they're not that invasive and it's not, it's not, they're not bad for you. There's no real major side effects. So why not? Yeah. And, you know, it's, so it's did, down to affordability, yeah. a lot of it. So where did you get the business uh, credentials to build a multi-million pound business? Did you just win? <laughs> yeah, just you, blinded. just winged it, mate. <laughs> yeah, just work, fucking hard work. Just yeah. constant hard work. I made it my life. We did clinics and we were in Blackpool doing clinics with my business partner at the time, Georgia McDonough. And um, basically, she introduced me to the industry. We worked together on Shameless. She was an extra. She introduced me to the industry and she did some treatments for me, Botox and filler treatments. It made me feel so good. I, need, I needed to be in. I needed to have a part of this because if I could go in and you know, potentially pay. She actually did it for free. But if I could go in and potentially pay what would have been around three hundred pound, I was in there twenty minutes. Work the figures out. Yeah. So I was like, wow, this woman can generate X in, in a busy week. So I was like, I've got to have a go at this. And we started with the clinics. I partnered up with Georgia. And then it's been about a month, maybe a couple of years, a year or so. It was about a year actually. I'm lying. I looked into getting access to the fillers so I could start. Distributing? Yeah, on mass distribution. And just going to the core of it and getting to the people, the key players, working alongside them. And it, it took off like phenomenal. It just went, we just hit the ground running. We were lucky because of timing. And I was able to get a brand of fillers. At the time, it was a Dermaren, it was called. Brought Dermaren to the UK market. We had a great success with that. Myself and my partner at the time, my other partner in terms of distribution, Liam, Liam Gill. And we basically, um, we got this distribution deal for a brand called Dermaren, which was a white label of a product called um, Revolax, which was, um, which is still a massive brand now, very popular brand. We don't use it, I can't use it or sell it for legal reasons. But Revolax, Dermaren was a white label. So we had a great success on the back of that because people knew, you know, the, the injectors, they know what they want and we knew what they wanted. So we had a huge success with that. And then Dermaren lost its CE approval so we could no longer sell it in the UK. No one's ever actually had this story before. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't sell it in the UK. So I searched desperately then for a new filler brand and we struggled. I started bringing other filler brands to the market, but not on an exclusive basis. And then after a couple of years, I managed to get the deal that I was been looking for. And we got the deal uh, with Jetima, and that was to distribute EPTQ, Epitique, throughout the UK, Ireland, and Channel Islands. And this kicked off just a few months ago. So the contract that we did with them was valued at 9.5 million, 
course, that's what they valued it at. So for us, obviously, with profits and whatnot, mm -hmm. it's slightly more excessive than that. But these are valuations based over three years. It's not like, oh, yeah, Jordy's got 18 million quid. Yeah. He's based mm -hmm. on, on turnover. And How does that make you feel, targets? though, that you've... It's easy when you go through all that misery from losing your friend to then a lot of people give up. Yeah. You've focused your energy. Mate. Yeah, Listen, mate, mate, as much as you have your moments, you've done fucking well, mate, so I'm proud of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. appreciate that. Yeah. But yeah, we've got an exclusive distribution You look deal. happy, mate. Yeah, I am. Uh, I am. Do you know what I, I mean? I am happy. I am. I'm just going through it all now in yeah. red light. But yeah, I am happy. I'm proud. Do you know I've what I mean? Well. You've done, you're still young. And the brand's flying. Yeah. It's already flying. We've, we've hit two lockdowns whilst having the brand. Mm -hmm. Like we signed the contract at the start of the second lockdown, first lockdown. Now we're in the second lockdown. We still managed to hit some massive targets. How's that? Did that affect business bad? Or did yeah, massively, yeah, because yeah. we're launching a new brand that needs to be injected in clinics. And we had three months where clinics weren't open. We just had another month of clinics not being open. Mm -hmm. You know, albeit um, professional clinicians, dentists, doctors, nurses, you know, no one's been able to operate. Yeah. So as long as they can't operate, the last thing they want to do is come and buy 100 fillers off mm -hmm. me and have four grounds with a stock sat in there. Is that the why clinic. you've been struggling the last few months? Yeah, not struggling, but we've just not been... It. Oh, excuse me, Mentally. you turned to mental health. I think it is. Yeah. I think because, yeah, because you're not hearing them pings. Yeah. You know, notifications mm -hmm. of sales coming through and, you know, and we can't post the things we want on social media because, you know, we don't want to upset and offend other people. And Have you got to keep busy all the time, Jody? Yeah, I have to, yeah. Or just go under. Yeah. Like, for me, the thought of not being in work for a month. We... I've met everyone come into work Um would it have been possible for them to work from home? Yeah, but would we have got the results and would I got the value out of my staff if they were all working from home? The answer is no. So ultimately, due to government guidelines, we can't facilitate working mm -hmm. from home. And we just split the office up a little bit and distance ourselves and put PPE in place. Yeah. And everyone's been fine. So while you've been struggling then mentally, what else has been happening? I just think just being away from people has made me struggle mentally. And don't get me wrong, I've nowhere near as bad as what some people have been experiencing. But sometimes anxiety gets better on me. So how have you been handling that? Breathing exercises. Yeah. Yeah, and less caffeine. Many no, coffees do you take I'm a on day? decaf now. <laughs> this is why I'm a bit shaky, it's that bloody tea. I think that's what it is. It's craving. But I've been on a lot of decaf mm -hmm. and limiting the amount of things I have with sugar in. Yeah. I did a stint in rehab as well. Never spoke about this publicly. Um... It wasn't for me, but I learned a lot from it. Um, I th again, my substance misuse is minimal. You know, I do drink sometimes, but not not every day and not a lot. But because I was going through anxiety and business were quiet, and there was an opportunity and I just wanted to go and sort of refresh and sort of exhaustion as well. So I took a, t took a week out. It was going to be two weeks, but I think it was going to be a month actually, but I did a week. What but kind of rehab? Uh, substance misuse and what have um, you taken Charlie no no in the past I have in my, yeah. in my early days yeah but recently no was this um, just like a therapy to talk to someone yeah it was a social thing as well I think because mm. we're in lockdown and mm -hmm. so I felt why not do it now be around people in the same bubble and share experiences with similar like minded people I looked at doing AA and it's all been video and v zoom and all that so weren't really for me then mm -hmm. You know, introducing myself to it via Zoom seemed a bit yeah. futuristic for me. So what was yeah. it like then in the rehab? Yeah, the, um, it's just when I got in there, I realised that the people in there had far bigger issues than what I did. So that made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, there were people in there, and this, this is not data protection I'm breaking because I'm not mentioning any, any names at all, but there's people in there who's getting a bottle of vodka from under the bed and necking what was left from the night before when they collapsed and then driving to shop piss to get another bottle. Mm. So they were like dealing with serious issues. So I felt a little bit like intrusive on them. Kind of like, I felt rude being there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like kind of other people need this more than I do. Mm. But, but since then I've come back and tried techniques that I've learned there that have enabled me to stop drinking for week long periods and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, but it would have opened your eyes, mate, and that could have given you the kick up the ass to Definitely realize. that caffeine. I'm like yeah. shaking. <laughs> but you don't, it's a bit cold yeah. in here as well. You know? <laughs> but you don't do many podcasts either. Why? Um, not done. First podcast ever. 
never done any. Um, a friend of mine, Martin Maloney, the guy who does Hardy Books, he's been asking me forever to do his podcast. I'm like, I don't do podcasts. So many people have been saying, come and do podcasts. I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't do them. And I didn't like the idea of being filmed and doing an interview. And I just, I don't know. I, just, I, I don't know. I just never fancied it. It was one of them things, I think, that you kind of need to just bite the bullet and get yeah. on with it. The thing with podcasts, you're kind of, you're opened up easier. It's not, nothing's kind of scripted and people... Mm can get any more trouble as well doing podcasts. Do you know what I mean? Where it is a free for all. It helps that there's not a massive audience there. Yeah. And then kind of like people mm. chucking in certain yeah. questions. Yeah. I don't know why really. I think podcasts have become huge over the past three years. And that's kind of when I took a step back from my acting career. It's not to say I've quit, by the mm-hmm. way. I've still got an agent. And ah, all you that. can. Never quit. Just I need can do acting time. at 60, 70, 80. We'll see. So plans for the future, brother? Peter Mullen as well, actually. Yeah. Scottish actor. You know Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Class. I did mm-hmm. a did a series with uh-huh. him. Love Peter. Great guy. Lovely guy. Peter Talk and... Um, Proper Ouija, innit? Who else? Hang me, Mullen. James Peter. McAvoy. James McAvoy. Yeah. Jamesy boy. James worked with James uh, and Peter. And O'Hara. It was in Braveheart. Is it David O'Hara? Yeah, I've worked with David Dave's O'Hara. Dave's a fucking nutcase. The only, the only big one. I've, I'm Robbie Coltrane I've never worked with. Yeah. But David O'Hara, yeah, he's class, that guy. Not, he was in Departed. Yeah, yeah. And he was Braveheart. in... Um, um, Tudors. Yeah. Tudors. Braveheart. That's where I met him on the Tudors. Yeah. yeah, and Braveheart, yeah. He's the guy who shows his arse, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's the one that says he's hearing voices and he's, uh, he's a nutcase, isn't it? Yeah, the Irishman. crackers. But yeah, top guy. Yeah, a lot yeah. of good talent on Scotland. Yeah, there is. Not Absolutely. Man. I'm just the top of the tree. I went to Scotland. I went to Greenock filming Waterloo Road. That was interesting. Why? It's just, just an interesting town. Greenock's nuts. I had Dan Tull on the podcast yeah. uh, last week and he was talking about Greenock. They had, at one point, they were having um, like private security. Not private, but it was mm-hmm. the on-set security. One point, if I went into Greenock, they'd have them come out with me. Because I was like, no, it's just about like that. They had a phone call or something saying someone's going to shank me up if I see me in green at town centre again. Yeah. I was getting really paranoid uh-huh. and like sometimes they just wanted this this one security guy to come with me if I ever went anywhere. Mm-hmm. I was like, they should be scared of me. I'm nuts. <laughs> I'm messy. What's your plans for the future, brother? Oh God, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I think I wanna... acting's in it. I can see it in your eyes, mate. Yeah. I've got to go back and do some acting. You know, it's like. I don't know if a title fight, don't I? Do you miss it? Yeah, I do, yeah. I do miss it. And now I'm comfortable, like, I can afford to do the roles that I want, not based on money or... Yeah. I made some stupid decisions because of money, like agreeing to do jobs because the money was just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And then it was that that slowed me down and stopped enabling me to get the jobs that I should have been getting, like the No Offences and Shameless and, you know, The Tudors and, mm-hmm. you know, that series I did, um, The Fixer. It's great that Netflix is back on net on yeah. Netflix is back. It's great that Netflix is showing Shameless again. Yeah. That's having some great response. Getting some attention from it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God, I was tiny. Like you look back, I was just look like a kid, little baby. But mm-hmm. it's actually twenty one. But you look at me, I look like such a yeah. juvenile and young, mm-hmm. and naive. Whereas now, I'm do you ever do your own film and direction or anything? And naive. Do you ever do your own <laughs> directing or anything? Yeah, yeah, I've done bits, but again, like. There's just so much involved. You got to give. I gave my life up for a year to focus on a film, and in the end, when it comes to right to the final hurdle, we lost all the funding. Do you know what I mean? And people who have been, you know, which I can only describe as stringing me on, stringing me along. Who just wanted to be involved in the whole production of it, and when it actually came to it, mm-hmm. we got let down for like a quarter of a million quid. It was only a shoestring budget. Yeah. But there were four or five people putting in quite excessive amounts and. They all pulled one, it had a domino effect, and then boom, 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 boom. Is that, does that happen a lot? In film, it happens all the time. What would your ideal role be? Good question. Mm. I think, I used to get asked this question a lot, and there's not really an ideal role, but I think that um, any challenging role, any challenging role would be welcome that involves me having to work for it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And like just being part of something that's just being part of some quality production be it British American European just something that's good that people are going to watch and enjoy yeah. I know, watched that so there's so much yeah. shit out there oh it's terrible but there's I mean, some great I stuff I spend an now. hour a day going through Netflix deciding what I don't want to watch yeah 
Mm-hmm. That's my that's my watching TV yeah. is flicking through all the shit mm-hmm. shows on Netflix going crap crap, and like my continue watching list is phenomenal. There's about three thousand different things on there. Yeah, because I put some on for ten minutes and go, oh my god, I can't devote any more of my mm-hmm. life to this. It's absolute macker. Mm-hmm. I watched a documentary. Stuff that's doing yeah. well, though, as well. That yeah. I'm not going to even name drop it, fear of not getting a job because that person <laughs> directed it. But stuff that you, that's being raved about, and then you're watching 10 minutes of it and thinking. Yeah. I watched one, though, it was class. It was like three cage fighters. It was like a dad and two Kingdom. sons. Oh, fucking Just phenomenal. started watching this on one episode. Yeah, the like first it. few episodes yeah. is slow, but it's mm. deep, mate. It is mm. deep. I'd cried many a times watching that. Mm. About you, you will relate to a lot to it. <laughs> mm. It's fucking oh, mad. Okay. So you will get in about yeah, it, mate. It's good. It I watched dark. the first one, but it it's is dark. dark. Yeah. It gets dark. Um, and I've been trying not to watch any dark stuff know, just mate. recently because every time a scene happens and I should be like, oh, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. My heart's just going like, I'm thinking, Jesus, I'm having a panic attack. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Anxiety kicks in. I'm like, mm-hmm. I can't even watch a TV after having yeah. a strong cup of tea. That was class. And I watched <laughs> um, the Jim Carrey one. Is it Andy Kaufman? He Netflix, he went right into character. I think he nearly gets sacked so what's many that? times. Is it Andy Kaufman? He played a part. Man in the Moon or something, but it shows you when he went right into character. He stayed in character twenty four seven. But the producers and the Carey did. Yeah, mm. the producers were trying to sack him so many times because he wouldn't come out of character because the part he was playing the guy was a bit loopy. Phenomenal, mm. fucking phenomenal, but really deep. And it shows you, you can see how it's Jim affected Carey's him. A fantastic actor, great actor, great actor. Great actor. It'd be nice to see him win an award for his acting achievements, yeah. really, because obviously there's a time in his life where he was never going to get an Oscar, but. You know mm. what I mean? Or an yeah. Emmy. Just for his... Because it's comedy, isn't it? For his talent. Comedy, it, comedy doesn't get noticed, does it? No, it, just, no, it doesn't. Um, but he is. He's fantastic Great actor. actor. Love watching June Carey. Mm. <laughs> People will be cringing now. What's he on about? <laughs> You're not, not an actor. He likes Jim Carrey. Yeah. How can he possibly mm-hmm. be an actor? Great actor, though. Yeah, for just, anybody watching that's maybe going through a struggle and a battle, what advice would you have for them? Um, reach out to family. Definitely. Even if it means that, you know... They'll be happy to hear from you, I think. And I think just get out, whatever it takes. You need space. You know, you need to get out, go for walks, get fresh air. Yeah. So there's that old cliche thing of saying, get exercise, it's the best thing for you. But it is, it really is. It is, mate, nature. It really is. I know we had to finish early because you're, you're a busy man. We, we I know, yeah, I feel longer, awful. But no, that's cool, brother, but you. Would you like to finish up on anything? Um, no, I think we've covered everything, haven't we? Yeah, yeah just that... Um, if anyone's not seen Netflix yet, go and have a watch of it. It's back on. Mm-hmm. Uh, excuse me, I keep saying Netflix. If anyone's not seen Shameless yet, it's back on Netflix. Um, watch it, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Yeah. And um, yeah, just stay positive. Reach out to family. So they, listen, mate, for coming on today, Thank brother. You. I, I Thank thoroughly you so enjoyed much. your story, mate. And Thank you. God bless you and all the best for the future, mate. I hope to see you in the big screen very soon. Yeah, and let us know when it's on so we can plug it. I will do, brother. All right, Thank mate. You. Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.